Hello, hello. Welcome to the Fuck It Up Comedy Club podcast. I'm your host, Kima Bob, and you are now tuned in to an unapologetic celebration of comedians of color who aren't cis men. And boy, oh boy, do I have an episode for you today. Now, this is an opportunity to hear dope stand up from lovely comedians and get to know them a little better. On today's episode, we have Ria Lena and Shazia Mirza joining me, and we had one of the most important conversations conversations ever held on this podcast and it's honestly an honor to share it with you but first I asked the gang to share with me a moment that they felt was fucking incredible I used to be a science teacher um, in the East End in an East End comprehensive and um, it was a really rough school and they hated me and I hated them and um, (laughs) so we got on just fine and um um, and I, I just used to hate it so much. And at the weekend, I went to this rave, um, and to this nightclub with my friends, and I, and I met this drug dealer. And, <laughs> and honestly, this is true. He said to me, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a science teacher. <laughs> and he said, oh, do you know what? I, I really need some pestles and mortars. Um, <laughs> to crush my drugs. Oh my gosh, that's the grinding thing. Yeah, and I, I said, oh yeah, no problem. I, I've got loads. Um, <laughs> and the, the next day, I went into school. I don't know, I just hated my job. I was really good. I've got to say, I was a good teacher though. Um, no, but I, I went into the school. I cleared out all the lab cabinets. <laughs> pestles and mortars, gauzes, tripods, heat mats. Um, everything. Centri- I took a centrifuge, everything. <laughs> um, cleared it out, put it into a Sainsbury's carrier bag. Yeah. And then the next weekend, I went into this nightclub and I gave it to him. Iconic. And he just was over the moon. He gave me some free. And, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and then, you know what, like, about six months later, I had this warning, verbal warning from the head teacher. <laughs> it, it wasn't about the equipment, it was about something else. Um, and, um, and then I left and I started stand-up, so I thought, I just felt really incredible that um, <laughs> I, I got out of it. Yes. I got out. Yes. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny and so epic. Like, no wonder you stand up now. You can't go back. <laughs> they won't have me back. You know, during the pandemic, some of my friends who'd given up teaching, they'd, they'd got text messages um, from, uh, like, London Borough of Tower Hamlet mm. saying, oh, will you come back? We are short of yeah, teachers. Teach I know, I never got one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so on the blacklist. Sad. I'm on the band list. I'm so sad. <laughs> Um, um, yes, yes. But I was really good. I just I believe that. I believe that. Um. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna I'm go poignant. All right. So um, I was married to a man who's twenty years older than me. Mm. That's that's the age gap, and he, he's white, which means that he's grown up in a very particular situation, which we all recognize that there's a certain there's a certain um, entitlement. Yes, it is. Yes. There's yes, a certain is. entitlement that it's not even. I won't even say it's their fault. They they're born. They don't know that they're acting in that way, or that everything they say, or the way that they phrase things, comes out that way. Mm-hmm. But it did contribute to, to, especially towards the end, towards me going, this this isn't going to work because I'm in this mind space. You know, and, and, and it's not a totally conscious thing. But one of the things that happened after we broke up is one of the conversations that we had, he said, you know, I don't like how you caricature me on stage. I don't like you talk about me on stage. Now, for my entire stand-up career, for the entire time that we were married, even when we were having sex still, um, <laughs> I would always make him a really old man. Like, I would always characterize him as old and decrepit, and, you know, and... <laughs> about to die, um, which maybe said more about my hopes and dreams than the truth, but, 
you know, I always characterize him that way because it was my way of respecting him in that and in, in making it so far from the truth that, mm. it, you know, that there was comedy there, but it wasn't the truth of who he is. He's actually quite a, a sprightly 62 year old <laughs> kung fu master. Um, <laughs> But after we split up, one of the things he said to me was, you know, I don't, I don't like how you talk about me on stage. I don't like how you characterize me. It's cruel. It's cruel and it's mean and I don't like it. Uh, and I realized uh, in that conversation, and, and this has happened many times over 18 years, I realized that what he was trying to do was obviously make me change the way that I was doing mm. my comedy. Uh, and I realized that, actually, hang on a second. I've always spoken about you that way and you never had a problem with it. You were always very understanding that... The, of what I was doing and, and, and the respect that I was actually giving you. And I realized in that moment that, uh, that he was trying to change the way I spoke about things, that he was unhappy because I was now suddenly much more successful in my career than mm. I ever had been mm. in, in our entire marriage. And that his issue was... Comedy. Well, he was probably always unhappy with it, but as long as I was unsuccessful, mm. he didn't have a problem with it. And so his issue wasn't how I was speaking about him. His issue was my newfound success and how many people that knew him were seeing my work and mm. seeing me talk about... But, but not just that, my truth. I went on mm. the Apollo and talked about... You know, I said I, I just spent the pandemic with my ex-husband. Uh, don't tell him he's my ex. He doesn't know yet. And... <laughs> And that was my opening joke, and he, you know, and he saw that go out to the entire nation, if not the world, um, and suddenly had problem. And I felt mm. fucking incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah! Oh. Hello, welcome to the fucking up comedy club. This is an unapologetic celebration of comedians of color who are not cis men. Nailed it. I'm your host, Kima Bob, and I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about self-care. Is that okay? I don't mean to sound like a BuzzFeed article. <laughs> I don't mean to sound like a listicle, but um, I find that it's hard whenever shit is going on, work-wise, romantically, etc., to stay like tuned in and to stay focused on yourself and I feel like social media right it can be helpful in some ways but in many ways not <laughs> like has anyone else been diagnosed with ADHD by Instagram <laughs> it's telling me I have everything and it's also trying to sell me pants <laughs> and I'm like girl if you know I have ADHD then <laughs> why do you keep advertising to me it's actually cruel it's actually unethical. Uh, it's wild. I, I've been trying to stay off of social media because, like, you know that thing where it just seems like everyone's having a great time, but you know they're not. Like, when you see those couples on, like, vacations, and they're like, mm, it's like, how many takes did it take to get that shot? <laughs> of you guys kissing under the stars. You know what I mean? Because I, sometimes I like to zoom in and look in the eyes. I, I, <laughs> Because if you do, if you zoom in, you can see the frustration. And it's like, that was take 12. <laughs> they tried that 12 times, and that's why they're mad. It's not even a good kiss anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I used to get triggered by, like, uh, baby and animal videos on social media. Because I was like, even though I'm a full-grown woman, I don't want to uh, watch anything experiencing a better childhood than I had. <laughs> the fuck? Why are you so nice to this baby? <laughs> fuck that baby, man. I want to see these kids neglected. Nobody's taking videos of that. <laughs> Making these dogs hot meals. Ugh. I've been on my meditation game. Any meditators in the house? Mm, word up. I wanted to meditate for a long time. It was on my, like, goals list for so many years. Um, and now I finally got it. And it wasn't even through, like, some beautiful spiritual experience. It was just because I was fucking somebody and they meditated every day. <laughs> Sometimes the best way to do it. I'm dating somebody that cooks now. Let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, 
oh, maybe I'll stop microwaving shit all the time. I, honestly, I think food is probably my next like self-care frontier because if I had a cooking show, yeah, I kid you not, it would be called um, Remove, <laughs> Remove Sleeve Pierce Film. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder who's on their self-care shit. And I have some uh, prizes, and I was just wondering if anyone would be down to say, like, share some self-care tips because I want to cultivate a community, a family, and family grow together. Hmm? Mm. And so I got some shit in this bag. Um, shouldn't call it shit, should I? It's not very enticing. Do you want some shit in a bag? But I got some shit in this bag um, uh, uh, for just a few people who might be able to share um, something that they've come to do recently that's brought them a lot of peace of mind, joy, pleasure. Sometimes we just need a little pleasure in this life. Shit's hard every day. Let's just feel good sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Um, okay, anyway, would anyone like to share for some mystery shit? <laughs> yeah? I started a gratitude list. You started a gratitude list. Ooh, guys, let's a round of applause for this. Yeah. How, how has it been? Can I pass this to you? Is that okay? It's an app, and it reminds me every morning when I wake up to list three things I'm grateful for. So it's an app. I, I, was, um, I was going to make a list, but I keep forgetting writing it down. So yeah. this app just pops up a notification every morning for me to list it. And Brilliant. then you will run out of things. So it becomes like, I'm grateful for the sun, or I'm grateful for this nice coffee. But yeah. then you have to list three day- things every day. Yeah, honestly, sometimes you just be like, I'm breathing again, killing it. <laughs> yeah, that's so sick. What's the app called? I think it's called like Half. Feet or happy feet or something like happy, that. Happy, great. Happy something. Everyone, <laughs> <laughs> happy something. It's not a very sophisticated app. It's just three reminder for you to list three things. Oh, brilliant. And what is your name, gorgeous? Oh, Baharak. Thank you for sharing that with us. A round of applause. <laughs> so great. I have an app recommendation um, if anyone wants to get into meditation. Insight Timer. Any fans? Mm-hmm. She's good. She's juicy. Insight Timer, what's cool about it is you can go in there and you can be like, oh, I only have five minutes and I'm worried about my stress or my anxiety or that bitch down the road. Um, and there won't be a category called that bitch down the road, but you'll know what she's making you feel. Uh, <laughs> it's really cool. It's free. It's fun. Um, and there are lots of different voices on it. Oh, I'm going to give you a prize. Okay. Do you have a bathtub? Do you like to use it? Here's a bath bomb from Lush. Enjoy. I think it'll be nice. Hopefully it won't irritate your genitals. It's stab in the dark bath bombs. Honestly. Um, does anyone else have a, a self-care tippy tape that they care to share with the film? Well, like, what I like to do is, like, kind of record nice things about myself. Like, I'll speak into, like, a, you know, like, when you're on microphone, I forgot what it's called. What, the, in, the one in your phone? Yeah, oh, that. voice notes. Voice notes, yeah. yeah so or I'll like, like record or whatever, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'll like record everything I want in my life. Yeah. And like everything that's like good about me. Yeah. And then I like listen to it every morning. Oh my God. Like it's kind of narcissistic, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very here for it. No, I'm very here for this practice. <laughs> That's really nice. So how often do you record yourself a lovely No, no, I just, I just, like, wrote it, like, one time, and I just listened to it. Yeah. Oh, so, like, if I, maybe my goals change, then I'll change it if I feel like something needs to be added to it. Yeah. But it's, like, quite good, because you kind of remember all the shit you want to do. That's so nice, and it's, yeah. like, your own, like, it's my affirmation own, Yeah, my own affirmation, yeah. That's so sick. Would you mind sharing maybe, like, one thing? Ma- maybe like... privately, but... Okay. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I'm looking at you, but what's what's so good about you? <laughs> what do you love? What do you love about yourself? What do you care about most? Your <laughs> your face or your feet? <laughs> okay. 
for those of you at home, uh, they just said that their face is perfect, so something for their feet, and now we know what's on the list. <laughs> okay, I have like a little foot mask and a little foot cream. I hope that you enjoy them. Enjoy your feet. Okay, you, cutie in the back, are you still down to share? Yeah. Vibe. <laughs> Welcome them to the stage! Um, would you tell us your name and your tip slash gift for the family? Yes. Hello. My name's Ade. Hello, um, Ade. Uh, somebody I know sent me a writing prompt um, that was to make a list of delights. Oh, delights. Yeah, delights, yeah. So it was very specific and it was very delightful to do. Mm. Um, so I would strongly recommend because you can keep adding to it but also when you return to it it's a very specific feeling of like yeah. lightness and fun so do you go to your list of delights sometimes and be like let me pick some up out of here and sprinkle on my day yeah for real it's nice it's the, yeah. similar to the personal affirmations but it's a bit more wide ranging yeah so it has things on it like um, a really funky bass line mm-hmm. and um, hands in my hair mm. and like a taste of like really good vanilla ice cream and like mm. things like that. Honestly, if you ever find yourself in Texas, try Bluebell. Their homemade vanilla is not a fucking joke. <laughs> <laughs> that goes Noted. for all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And... Ade, please, you're missing out on a vitamin C facial sheet mask. (laughs) A round of applause for everyone who shared. Aw, how fucking wholesome. Yeah. This performer is absolutely incredible. I'm delighted to have her. Honestly, the fee is not enough to deserve her. Um, so please give her all of the energy and love that you have as we welcome to the stage the incredible Ria Lina! <laughs> Oh, ah, yes, it's working. Hi, thank you for that. Thank you so much. That was, that's one hell of an introduction to live up to. Uh, can I just say that that was that was huge? I mean, I'm good. I'm not that good. There's a fee. There was a fee. You mentioned <laughs> a fee. That's really what I took from that. Um, so this is this is wonderful, weird and wonderful for me. Can I just say to be here because I'm 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 from the I usually play to the mainstream comedy circuit, which is is very white. Uh, it, you know, it's very mainstream. Let's just say it's very mainstream. And so it's, it's unusual for me to play to, to allies. It's a, different, it's a different feel. And this is so wonderful and, and, and you're, you know, delightful and, 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 and encouraging of yourselves. And I'm not used to that. I'm used to that kind of guilt that white people carry around with them. And then I, I p- prey upon that. Uh, <laughs> for my laughs. Um, so... Forgive me in advance if I do the entire set to Voldo. Uh, <laughs> the South African that has so kindly sat in the front and just provided me with a foil. Uh, it's just good. Like, you know, there's, there's white and then there's white. And you know what I mean? And then, then there's, and there's, there's guilt and then there's guilt. So uh, it's, it's almost like I pre-ordered it in my, in my rider. Uh, so it's... It's, it's what, thank you very much for being here. Because uh, I, I, I come from an interesting background when it comes to these sorts of, uh, you know, from these sorts of perspectives because I'm, I'm mixed race. My mother comes from the Philippines, but my father is German, which means I want to take over the world, but only to give it a really good clean. <laughs> But as those of you in the room can see, I'm, I, you know, I, I look and I do identify as Asian, I, and as Asian as I can be. I mean, I didn't always know this, though. I don't know how many of you felt this growing up. I grew up here in the West. I grew up in, in pretty much in England and in the Netherlands. Um, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> but I grew up in those places, so I didn't realize until I was about 17 years old, I'm not white. Because you don't, you don't look at yourself every day. You look at other people. They look at you more than you look at yourself, okay? And, and so I didn't realize that I'm, I'm not white. 
uh, people see me differently. And I don't know, maybe I was blessed or I was in a very small community that I didn't really feel that, um, you know, feel any kind of negativity and, until that point. In fact, um, I remember... I remember my dad saying recently, because my, my, I grew up in a very small village in the Netherlands. It's, it's quite small. It, it, it's, it's Dutch. Well, Waldo will know. Grandparents uh, <laughs> probably came from there. Um, I realized, I kind of came to that realization about, you know, different people, different faces, different races uh, when I was 17. And I realized I'm not white. I'm, I'm Asian. And even though my mother always said we are Asian and we identified as Asian, there's, there's, there's the moment that penny drops. Do you know what I mean? There's a moment where you realize, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm good at math. <laughs> like I'm properly good at math. You know what I mean? Oh, that explains why I can play the piano and I've never had a lesson. <laughs> also kind of explains my horrendous human rights record. <laughs> I am, I'm just testing where the level is for the crowd. Okay, we could, I mean, we could use other references. That's why I can make an iPhone in under 3.5 seconds. <laughs> just, okay, why, well, dude, you laughing a little too much. You know what I mean? I get it. The one time that I bring up the one thing Asians are worse at than you, human rights records, just going, okay. I arrived at this epiphany. It's just like, oh my gosh, I'm in a special club. I'm in a special club. I'm Asian. How many of us could there be? <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> I didn't actually get to Asia until I was well into adulthood. I'd never really traveled there because even though my mother is, is from the Philippines and, and very much looks like, as you would expect, my mother's been through the change. You've all heard of the Asian change. You, you know, okay, a few of you know what I'm talking about for, well, for Waldo. Um, <laughs> Asian women don't... Well, all races age differently, actually. It's, it's fascinating, scientifically true. All races age a little bit differently, so... Um, Black people, for example, if I could start there as an example, essentially black people will hit an age at 14 and then they stick with it until they die. <laughs> right? You know, they say black don't crack, well, yellow don't mellow. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> White people, just to get, let you know, Waldo, they, they age quite... You age quite steadily. It's really quite impressive. You can pretty much tell what age a white person is just by looking at them, at least to the decade. Do you know what I mean? At least to the decade. Can I recommend moisturizer? Um, <laughs> if I could. And then Asian, Asian women, especially Asian men and women, but Asian, uh, Asian people, uh, they, they age this way. They are essentially 12 until the day that they're 90. <laughs> That's it. There is no in between. It's just 12, 90. Uh, one of the things that's happened to me recently is um, I've, I've, I'm getting divorced. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Someone who gets me. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, we, were, we were married now. Uh, we were married for 18 years, and I found out that 50% of marriages end in, in divorce, which means the other 50% end in death. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm making the choice. Uh, I want to stay in control of my life. So, I, yeah. And, and, and 18 years means that I have successfully completed a relationship. So uh, I've been told that badge is in the post, which I'm looking forward to. But it means that I'm now out dating. I'm out dating, but I'm dating. Uh, I've never dated before, especially not the way that dating happens now. I, so I'm out dating, and I'm realizing that as someone who's come out the other end of a relationship, so I'm not looking for the one. I'm just looking for someone. Uh, <laughs> that it, it's a very different approach. Uh, you know, things like, I found that a lot of my young compatriots that, that, that enjoy dick uh, don't actually want the dick up front. They don't, they, they, they want the dick, but not, they don't want the dick. Like, they want the dick eventually, but they want the dick to talk and like, you know, and, <laughs> and, other, and other things that I'm just going, but, but what, you know, because they're looking for the one, whereas I'm looking for just dick. Um, so, so, uh, so what, I'm, what am I trying to say? I don't know why I'm trying to be so nice. Are we allowed to swear on this? Do you cut that out? Do you beep it out? What are we... Is this... Oh, okay. This, so this bit stays in as well? Oh, okay. Wow. This is really raw. And, and, uh, talking about it. So I'm out, there, I'm out there. I like the dick pick up front. I'm going to be blunt with you. I want the dick pick up front. Okay? I, I've just come out of an 18-year marriage. I don't have two weeks to waste dating you. <laughs> to then find out your all personality, all right? I, 
I need to know what we're working with. I made a couple of kids, all right? In the meantime, the things shift and change down there. It's how we know God is definitely a man, because if God was a woman, he would have thought that through, okay? Every time a woman has a baby, he'd add a layer to the man's penis. Do you know what I mean? Like, you should be able to cut a man's penis in half and tell exactly how many kids he has by the rings on a tree. But you can't. You know, <laughs> or an onion. I mean, tree, onion. <laughs> that thing's going to make someone cry, so might as well. But I'm, I'm, like, I'm, actually, I'm actually at a point, and I can't be the only person out there that's like, you know what, can we just lead with the dick pic? Why do we keep leading with faces? Face, you know, you can take a million pictures of one person in a day, and they'll look different in every single one of them. Just lead with the dick pic. I want an app that just leads with dick pic, and then under that, you can tell me what you do for a living, and then if I'm still interested, all those stupid questions underneath, all right? <laughs> Penis pension personality. That's how I want an online date. That's what I want to do. I'm just, I'm just being honest. That's where I'm at with this. Um, and it frustrates me as well that you can't be a, you can be a fuck boy, but you can't be a fuck girl. Why can't I just go out? They're like, if I fuck on the first date, they lose interest and go. And it's just a biological imperative. It's just what happens to men in oxytocin. They just go, oh, I fulfilled that. And they move on, right? And I, and, you know, I want to be able to fuck on a first date and then, you know, go, oh, I can work with that. We'll do another one, right? <laughs> You know, we'll figure something out, all right? Okay, we won't do it from behind. You can't reach. But, you know, whatever. Whatever it is. Just, uh, on one of the apps, um, because, of what, because I do this for a living, on one of the apps I don't put my head on. I just put, like, pictures of my body. Um, and, which means that I have to do a face reveal once we've matched and we're talking. I have, to do, I have to do essentially a face reveal. And through that, I have discovered that I am apparently not Asian enough for an Asian fetish. Thank you. I, I love how you knew exactly what noise to make, because I wasn't sure what noise to make. Yeah, I'm not Asian enough. I've had three people unmatch me the moment they saw my face. I mean, is it, is it, is it that I look legal? I don't know. What, what is an Asian fetish? What is the problem? Do you, do, do you know? But, you know, I am, I am Asian. But then I've noticed as I've gotten older, like the white jeans have kind of woken up and sort of gone, hang on, we're here. Don't forget about us. <laughs> but in ways that I don't really want to. Like, like now I have to moisturize all the time. When I was a kid, I didn't have to worry about my face. I looked 12 no matter what I did. And now I'm started going, oh my God, I almost look 90. Like you wake up sometimes and go, oh no, I just didn't sleep enough. Or, you know, you know when I didn't use a pillow. Um, it, it, the age is happening. <laughs> The age is coming. And, and just little things like before, when I was, you know, when I was, when I was aging in my 20s and whatever, I could just eat whatever I wanted to eat. And the body would just be like, don't worry, we'll deal with that. You want to have a burger? You want to have extra fries? You want to have a milkshake? That's fine. We'll deal with that. And now my body's going, I don't know what to do with this. I'm going to just put it on your hips for later. <laughs> I'm just going to put it there. Just like, there's like, I got room right on the outside of your thigh. And I'm like, well, what use is that? Like, just right, I'm just going to put that there. Like, it's also like... <laughs> You know, like just little things that I'm just going that's not because it didn't happen to my mom so it must be from my dad's side of thing but the worst thing that I realized and this is where I was just like I don't know what to do like I don't know what to do the, the re when I really realized that those white jeans are waking up and they're doing something is when my daughter told me that she wanted to go to drama school and I was fine with that <laughs> I know I know I, I mean I, I'm going to speak to someone about that because I, I don't I don't know what to do. Um, disown her? I don't know. I, don't, you know. I mean, the white part of me is like, you'll pay for it, bitch. That's what you do. And then you'll raise her children when she gets pregnant accidentally because she's blonde. I, I just, I, you know, you know what I mean? Anyway, folks, you've been, you've been lovely. Uh, um, thank you so much. I'm going to see you a bit later. I'm Rialina. <laughs> We have one more comic for you tonight. Um, <laughs> please get us started with a round of applause as we welcome to the stage the incredible Shazi Amirza! Good evening. Good evening, Wembley. It's really, it's so great to be here. I've done big gigs in my time, but this is fucking massive. <laughs> This is huge. This is the biggest gig I've ever done in my life. It's amazing. Thank you, everybody. It's so nice to be here making eye contact with people in my underwear. Because uh, I haven't worn a bra for 18 months. Um, my breasts have been self-isolating. 
uh, they've really enjoyed the break from the local builders <laughs> and they've now found company under my armpits. <laughs> my name is Shazia Mirza. Um, I hope I said that correctly. Um, <laughs> No, pl no, please don't be offended um, if, uh, if I've got that wrong. Um, I'm not used to pronouncing foreign names um, since Brexit. Um, I once did a gig in Northern Ireland where they thought that some of the letters in my name were silent. I was introduced to Shave Aminzad. <laughs> Shave Aminzad sounds like a Pakistani hair removal product. I wasn't offended, I didn't kill anybody, nobody got murdered. Um, a few days later, I was walking down the street and this man came up to me, he said, I love your work, Malala. <laughs> and, um, I thought, yes, that's right, that's right. Any brown woman that's done anything now is either Mindy Kaling or Malala. <laughs> I just take it now, I say, yes, yes, that's me, that's me. Um, yeah. Um, I got shot in the head, now telling jokes. Um, um, it's going really well. Um, sometimes I even bake cakes on Channel 4. I mean, yeah, I mean we're all the same woman. I mean, um, the BBC are running with that one, aren't they? They're like, we've got one, we've got one. We've got one, it's a proper one, it's a proper one. Uh, head scarf, smiley face, <laughs> bakes cakes, non-threatening, let's put her on everything. <laughs> One minute she's baking cakes lopsided for the Queen, next minute she's presenting mental health programmes. Should we read the news next week on Channel 4? Oh, they've already got one. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm not that easily offended. Um, but before the pandemic, I went for this meeting at the BBC uh, with, this, with this white man. Um, now, white men <laughs> are fucked now. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't know why you bothered coming out tonight, sir. Um, I mean, there's absolutely nothing here for you anymore. Um, uh, nobody gives a shit what you have to say. Uh, no one cares about your opinion. You can't get on the BBC. When was the last time you saw a white man on the BBC? I mean, 1954. I mean, where are they? Um, I miss them. I miss that diversity. Um, but, you know, it has to be this way. It has to be this way. Because when I was growing up, nobody on TV ever looked like me. My dad always used to say to me, hurry up, hurry up, get downstairs. Trevor is on the TV. <laughs> because Trevor MacDonald was the closest thing to an Asian woman at the time. <laughs> And these white men are taking it very badly. Um, and I went for this meeting at the BBC about, uh, about my sitcom. So it was about comedy. And, and uh, this meeting was with an old white man. So you, sir. And um, I have to say, old white men are the worst. They are the worst because they have been oldest and whitest for longest. <laughs> and they refused to change their ways. And I was at this meeting at the BBC about my sitcom with this old white man, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the meeting, he said to me, can you cook? And I thought, my God, it, it's turned into a fucking date. <laughs> he, he said, can you cook? And I was so taken aback, I said, yes. And he said, what do you cook? Muslim food. <laughs> I thought, Muslim food? What's that? <laughs> he, like, Nando's. <laughs> <laughs> Kebabish. Halal fish and chips. I mean, he just looked at my face, put me together with some food and made it Muslim food. <laughs> 
thought, when have you ever heard anyone say, do you fancy going out for a Muslim? <laughs> but I never said anything. I never said anything. And, um, you know, before the pandemic, I was talking to this friend of mine. I'm, af I'm afraid it's all true. I mean, it's re this really happened. Um, and um, the thing is, um, before the pandemic, I, went, I was talking to this friend of mine and, and she said to me, oh, you know what? I said, I'm finding this really difficult. And she said, well, oh, you'll be fine. You're a strong woman. And I thought, what does that mean? Strong woman, you know? Are there loads of women just going around being strong? 24 hours a day, lifting cars, <laughs> chopping down trees, hunting, killing men. I mean, you know, like, am I a cup of builder's tea? You know, a Russian shop putter or the leader of Scotland? Because those lesbians, they're all strong, aren't they? I mean, no. Because any woman that's done anything now is now a lesbian, you know. You know, like Hillary Clinton, lesbian. <laughs> Angela Merkel, lesbish. That Scottish one, definitely a lesbian. <laughs> no, what does Mary do in the office? Oh, she's strong, she's strong. But only till 3.30. And then, um, then she has to go and pick up the kids. Also, there's four or five days in the month where she's really not that strong, you know. She just sits around watching Hugh Grant films and stuffing herself with Twix. <laughs> We're all so strong. None of us are able to push through the glass ceiling. Yeah? When one of us does break through, there's loads of double glazing men on the other side going, don't worry, darling, we can fix that. As an Asian woman, I get awards just for leaving the house. Oh, my God, she's so strong. So brave. So inspirational. Give her an MBE. Yeah? But am I really strong, you know, out of me and Jeff here? Who would you ask to lift a cooker up the stairs? Oh, you mean emotional strength. Okay, well, we'll come back to that in an hour. You know, there is this, you know, idea that being a, a strong woman is absolute, you know, 100% and enduring. And that once you do one thing that defines you as that, then that is you forever. People think that because I'm a comedian that I'm a strong woman. But they never saw me crying in Poundland yesterday. <laughs> when they'd run out of my favourite toothpaste. <laughs> Or last week when I couldn't find a car parking space and I was late for my eyelash lift. <laughs> and I mean, a lot of people, they do think I'm strong. Some people think I'm controversial. You know, people like ISIS. Um, <laughs> and and um, other extremist organisations uh, like the BBC. Um, um, they, they think I say controversial things. I mean, look, um, we all know what happened, you know. Um, the Queen killed Diana, we know that. Um, <laughs> look, I, I've actually met the Queen. I, this is true. I've met the Queen three times. That's quite a lot, really, isn't it? Um, she doesn't realise she's met me before. Um, no, she probably thinks I'm Lenny Henry. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> It's very surreal, you know, when you meet the Queen. Because, uh, um, you know, I've grown up with this woman all my life, you know. This woman is on the back of my money. Um, I lick this woman's head on stamps every day. Um, I've got friends that have snorted cocaine through this woman. And, um, and now I actually get to meet her. And, um, you know, there's a perception that the Queen talks like this. It's true, she really does talk like this. And I was standing in line to meet her, and I put my hand out to shake her hand, and she said, and what do you do? And for some reason, I got very nervous. And I started talking like that as well. <laughs> she went, and what do you do? I went, I went I'm a comedian. <laughs> and I felt my Birmingham accent going up three social registers. <laughs> At one point, I actually said, yeah. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, you go, when you go to meet the Queen, you think, you know, if I actually meet the Queen, what am I going to say? But when you get there, you get so nervous, you don't actually say what you really want to say. And when she said to me, and what do you do? What I really wanted to say to her was, did you kill Diana? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you know, but I, I thought, you know, I can't, I can't, you know. <laughs> I'll never be able to drive through the Blackwall Tunnel again. Um, <laughs> um, look. I mean, for a Muslim woman to go against the grain of a patriarchal culture, I'm considered to be a strong woman, you know? Uh, people look at me and they go, oh my God, she's got opinions on ISIS and she's not dead. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the label of strong, it, it doesn't mean anything. The only time I, I ever felt there was no hope uh, was when I was 14 years old. Um, and my parents... I was, I was brought up in Birmingham. Um, obviously, I, I don't live there anymore because I'm doing well. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> um, the, the, only, the only time I ever felt there was no hope was when I was 14 years old. And my parents, they wanted me to marry a 50-year-old man from a village in Pakistan um, with one kidney and a really big moustache. And of everything about that, the thing that bothered me the most was the moustache. <laughs> I'm really competitive. He can't have a bigger one than me. <laughs> but I got out of it by trying to join the IRA. Um, <laughs> which confused my parents for long enough that Mr. Moustache got married to my brother instead. <laughs> so, anyway, everybody, you've been lovely and we're going to have a discussion now about ourselves. <laughs> Kima B, letting you know that if you like listening to us fuck it up in your house, if you like listening to us fuck it up in your car or on your train, you will absolutely love being in the room where it happens. We usually record our episodes in London in front of a live audience, and let me tell you, it's one of the most beautiful audiences I've ever seen, and I would love for you to join us. For more info, check out Fuck It Up Comedy on Insta or Twitter, or go to fuckitupcomedy.com. Okay! to the stage, the other incredible comic you've seen tonight, Rialina! Oh, welcome, welcome. Yes, please have the seat. Gang, what a fun, beautiful time we've had. Um, so, I have um, worked with you before, uh, Shazia, on... Um, oh, sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, have you guys seen Sorry I Didn't Know? Oh, naughty, naughty. So, it is a um, game show about black history. And let me tell you, Shazia knew so much more shit than me. <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, what, what does she know that I don't know? The answer is everything. Uh, was that that's, been... that's because, you know, when I was growing up, I thought I was Trevor MacDonald. <laughs> Yeah, we worked Hi. together like uh, only once before, and it was on Zoom. It was. So I was like meeting you in the flesh for the first time. I feel like I'm getting to know you for the first time. But you guys have known each other for a little minute. Like you guys have been pals on the scene. When did you meet? <laughs> Years ago. In the, in the, when we first started comedy, yeah. around the same time. Yeah. And there weren't many women, and there weren't many people of color. Now, I noticed you being vague about time. <laughs> oh, when, oh, God, how long was it? 15 years ago? I respect no, it. No, I'm not that old. No, I like it. I like it. I like it. I'm it was only yesterday. 12, Shadia. But you I'm know, 12. I started comedy when I was 22. That's wild. Mm. And today you're 33. <laughs> I'll play the game. Okay. <laughs> it's 11. <laughs> No, that's, that's sick, though. Yeah. Like, that's really cool. So, like, can you tell me a bit about, like, um, how it was I started... Uh, I started doing improv in, like, 20-some shit. I think 2012. And then I started doing stand-up in, like, 2015. Um, but, yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is things have been uh, different and uh, still not great. 
uh, created this space, which has helped me a lot. Because um, I, I get to perform with other, you know, comedians of color, um, but not the cis men. Um, just cause. Yeah, Waldo. <laughs> yeah, come on. Um, but yeah, and I get to perform in front of an audience that is like truly mixed and queer and makes me very happy. Um, honestly, you guys are a treat. But like, what was the what was the scene like when you guys were starting out? Um, approximately yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were never allowed to gig. At the same in the same place at the same time, were we? No, mm. no, you couldn't put two women on the bill because we might synchronize. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the health and safety implications of that. <laughs> Blood everywhere. This is how messed up it was. I remember when they did start putting more than one woman on the bill, mm. freaking out, going, mm. "But what if she does my jokes? Like, mm. what if what if we do the same jokes? Because we would because we I never had to." We, well, I mean, we're so unique anyway. That's the irony of it. I, I, no one's doing my jokes. Yeah. Yeah. No, one, no one's living well, my life and my experiences. You get put in a position where, like, it's like a scarcity mindset is, like, created for you. Well, precisely. So when someone else came in with a vagina, I was like, oh, my gosh, but what? But I have a vagina. <laughs> but I, I have a, this is what made me calm down was when I went, hang on a second. Comedy up till now has been for white men, four straight cis white guys on the bill, mm -hmm. distinguishing themselves from each other. And then I really Honestly. started paying attention, going, how are you doing that? Like, how, what are you talking about? Because they all had wives and mother-in-laws, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and amazingly, nobody noticed that they were not the same or the same. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what audiences walked away with, but I, I mean, it really... I don't... I, uh, <laughs> but... It, I mean, it helped. It really helped to break that up because everyone would be like, oh, I liked the girl. And, you know, you would be remembered for that. Well, You wouldn't get booked on telly or anything, but you'd be remembered by, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. poor people would be like, oh, I wish there was some kind of way I could follow her online independently of, you know, television and, and mm. you know, the mainstream media structure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, when I started, um, I was the only Muslim woman in comedy in Britain. I was, the, I was the first one, and I was the only one. And, um, and there was another comic, there still is another comic called Shapi Sandy, who's, yes, who's, Ira yes. who's Iranian and um, atheist. But they always used to mistake me for her and her for me. So when uh, we'd go up to Edinburgh, all the white male critics would write about her, but they were talking about me. <laughs> and they'd talk about her and vice versa. Jeez. And any comparisons would only be between us two and nobody else. And it was really difficult, I have to say, because there, there weren't many women, there weren't many people of colour, and it was always just me uh, at Jonglers with a group of white men in a, a dressing room who didn't like me because I was getting attention, because I was different. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of bullying, there was a lot of backstabbing, mm. they, it wasn't very supportive. And um, of when we started, there's, o there's only a few of us that are still going, mm. especially women. There's only like a handful, maybe four or five of us still going. Um, it might be seem like a like obvious question. I think I have uh, an idea of why, but why do you think some of those people stopped going? Comedy is hard. It's really hard. Not just the comedy, it's the life, driving up and down the motorway, not getting paid much money, not getting opportunities, having constantly doors slammed in your face. It wears you out. And in the end, some women go, do you know what, I think I'll just be happy having a family and I having think I'll a just husband, be happy. W. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a huge sacrifice to really be a, to be a stand-up. Mm. Mm. I, I think the having the family thing is the other thing, is that it's easier for male comedians to have families than it was traditionally for female comedians to have families because you had to, you know, you had to, like, make the family and then you had to, like, feed the family from your own body and... <laughs> And then, you know, and then certain members of the family weren't old enough to come to work with you or that was frowned upon, you know, or you needed someone else to, like, hold the family while you were on stage for all of 20 minutes. 
Um, yeah. And even though all the people you worked with often had similar types of family at home, they were just like, I'm not going to hold your baby. Um, so it was, that was the, I think that's the other thing that, that saw a, a detrition of, of numbers was mm. as, they, as they went. Or, and, and also, actually, to be fair, a lot of them were great writers and they went, I can make money at home and I don't have to, uh-huh. I don't have to, you know, my feet, you know, wash my trainers because they're covered in goo from mm, the nightclubs the that we were playing clubs, in and, yeah. you know, and come home s- smelling of green rooms and the rest of it. And so they, they all moved, they moved into writing. Um, yeah, yeah. And it really picked up for me when I realized that there was only one Muslim female comedian on the circuit, and if I just converted, that there would be a lot more opportunity for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads now. <laughs> there are, I mean, when I started, I used to wear the hijab, and, um, and then I got a lot of bullying and criticism for wearing it. Mm. So then I took it off. And um, now there's loads of them wearing them mm. on the circuit. Like, there's about five, which is a lot. <laughs> it's ri- that's a lot for like 10 years, for like just like five Asian women to come along. I hear you. I feel like the, um, the change. So I, I be hunting. I be hunting for women and trans and non-binary comedians of color. I try to keep my eyes on the streets. And I think um, there's still a long way to go as far as representation. And what you do see is um, a lot of places trying to cover their ass and not seem racist. And they'll be like, oh, let's just throw this woman at everything. Uh, there was a moment, honestly, I did a lot of like TV work uh, in 2020, 2021. I wonder why. <laughs> like people were like, we need black. Where's black? <laughs> oh, oh, black American. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Is that how I met you on that show? That oh, probably. <laughs> I, I honestly think that show might have gotten picked up because they were like, we, meet, we well, need more black. I'll tell you about that show. Sorry, I didn't know, which is, mm. it, it, I just was on there. Oh, I'm on the next Jimmy. Series. Have you seen Jimmy? So Jimmy Akimbola, oh. who hosts Sorry I Didn't Know, is a he's now the, the new fresh, fresh he's, prince. He's now Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So good. And now he's in mm. LA, like, and he's just like, oh, me and Issa Rae. Yeah. Like, oh, Jimmy, I'm so happy for you, but I wish I was in your body. <laughs> I just, you, I said, just so did the, the third series with him, and he yeah. said that when uh, George Floyd died, six months later, they got that show commissioned, mm-hmm. and now it's on its third series because everybody loves it so much. Mm-hmm. So the poor black man had to die before anything got moving. Mm. TV is fucking sick, and the world is sicker. It, I mean, it, it often works that way, that, that something will happen in the news, and then they'll yeah. go mm-hmm. and look. Because I remember, you're, you know... There'd been some things that had happened. They went, we need Muslim. And, you, and suddenly mm. you, you took off in a trajectory. And I remember watching and that. And now we're on the back burner. Nobody gives For a now. Shit. Yeah, well, yeah. I get, but, you know. There's well, they've got I'm... Nadia cooking and baking. <laughs> and, 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 ah! and, and this is so racist because they thought, you know what? We've got one smiley happy girl on the TV yeah, yeah. in a hijab oh, baking. They love that, an that'll do. Brown. That'll do. Oh. Well, well, it's, now, it's, it's, it's quite friendly, isn't it? Because you can uh-huh. track how it went with... There was only ever one black woman allowed on TV at a time in comedy. Mm. And it was Jeannie Ashray. She was amazing. But Rusty Lee Ashray. before then. then yes. Then Rusty. But that, now we can... Yes. They're like, wait, we can have more than one at the same time? Yeah. Yes. No, no, but do you know... More than one. It's like what you said about... Um, like, they, they think now I'm not Muslim enough because I've taken my hijab off. Mm, 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 mm. So they need, uh, they need somebody that's really Muslim. So I, I want to see it. So they've, yeah, they, they, so they've got Nadia because she really looks like it. <laughs> so now, and I'm not Muslim enough, so I've got to bring, I've got to come back really yeah. in a niqab. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> well, as we Commit. know from my set, I'm not Asian enough, no, so yeah. I'm, mm. you know... I'm How the has thing that been with, for you? Uh, yeah. like, because I know, like, I have a, a friend who is um, half white and half East Asian, and uh, there have been times where they've been booked, and people want them to talk about race, but that's not what they talk about, and then they're not booked again because they're not standing up there being like, this is my experience as an East Asian person. They're just like, this is my experience as a human person. Well, that's the, I think that's exactly the problem we're still looking at, and I, it's not the right phrase, so please feel free to replace it with better, but white friendly. It's mm-hmm. like, well, you know, we are, you know, they go, well, we want you to talk about what we want you to talk about. We want, we've put you in a box, or we've decided mm-hmm. that this is what you are, and if you. The white gays, yeah. But that's hashtag what, white gays, hashtag fuck pod. But that's why. <laughs> what? 
I, I'm not understanding how she has white gaze. What is that? White gaze. Is that Waldo? So, no, wait, know, what? what? You know, um, but that's why. It's Waldo. It's Waldo. White, Waldo, men, white it? men still have the power. Yeah, white, white men yeah. still have the power because yeah, yeah. they're dictating to us yeah. what we should be doing to please them. Whilst percent. we're on the front line showing visibility, but yeah. really we're not. Honestly, so um, I view uh, Fuck It Up as something that could easily be a bomb-ass TV series. And until people are comfortable enough to be like, can it be fronted by can women of color, blah, 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 blah. They said that it would m- frighten white people. We need a new... It would frighten white it, people. It wouldn't. It would make white people feel uncomfortable. So I have to dilute. But they watched dilute Saw. It. They watched all the Saw movies. <laughs> <laughs> they come up with some crazy ass shit and then go, oh, but the brown people scare us. Look what that's. I'm dead. D- dilute it to make it friendly. Yeah. For it's white so audience. Good. And then you you do dilute the heart out of it, you know? And the what, truth out of yeah. it. Yeah, and also, what I think what's frustrating as, like, a person of color to always have to cross a bridge, you know what I mean? I've watched so many things. Like, growing up, there was so much comedy that I watched that was about, like, white male teens. I thought I was fucking uh, <laughs> Seth Rogen or something like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, so much of my sense of humor has been formed by, like, super bad in shit like that. <laughs> like, you know, and it's just like... You are so brave to admit that. Thank you. Can I just say? Thank you. This is a safe space. Honestly, and, oh, McLovin. I mean, part of me is judging, but I, I think oh, it's... But you know, so there's so many times where I've crossed a bridge to um, allow myself to be entertained or entered into a fucking world. I've never had a boner in my life. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know so much about them. Um, <laughs> It's amazing how much we know about the male appendage versus the vagina. Honestly, and I just feel like I just I want there to be more stuff like that out there. And why is it always, you know, um, people of color crossing the bridge and not other people crossing the bridge? Learn about some shit you don't know about. Have some fun. You know, be delighted by difference. And, and oh, I hate fucking tolerance. You hate tolerance. I hate the word tolerance. Oh, hate the word tolerance. Right. Okay. Like, that's oh, too- acceptance. Yeah, things. I hate tolerance. Yeah. Hate tolerance. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I, I'm gonna? Do you know what? Is this being recorded? I hate tolerance. <laughs> uh, I just hate the idea of like tolerating something. I'm like embrace it. Do you know what I mean? Like less tolerance, more like give me that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in my mouth. Yeah. God. What a wild. Honestly, honestly, I can't. Like, even imagine the shit you guys have been through in the, what, ten, five years that you've been doing? <laughs> um, it's well, this was I... my first gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> smashed it. Absolutely <laughs> smashed it. Um, can I ask you um, how you take care of yourself in the uncertainty of this industry and how you've, like, looked after yourself over the years with all this shit going on? And is she tying it back to self-care? Yes. <laughs> well, we never had self-care, really. Mm. Like, we, there was, mm. we never heard of self-care. Till, it's, mm. it's a recent thing. Like, Honestly, it's, it's the it's listicles. The listicles are why I know. And I think in comedy, people always assume if you were a female comedian, you were a strong woman. So no, nobody ever asked you if you were okay. You okay. No one ever asked me if I was okay, if I needed help, or if I needed anyone to talk to. Nobody ever did that. Mm. As you heard in my set, I've recently gotten divorced, so I've started having sex again, uh, which is which is really exciting. Is it huge? Well, well, like I said, well, they're these all are, huge. These are average. Yeah. Uh, so that's. But I think I think actually the pandemic was a real game changer for mm. me as a comedian because up to that point, you you take you know the idea of saying no in comedy is. There, you know, the idea of being offered something and saying no to it mm-hmm. is, is unheard of. It's, Will there it, be another one? And well, how dare you? It, precisely, is, is, is you would take, you would say yes to every gig, no matter where it was. Will you come to Cornwall for fifty quid and, and pull the rickshaw? Yes, mm-hmm. of course I will. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, I think, that was definitely trained into both of us early on because, again, as women, you don't want to be difficult to work with. That was a huge label. So, oh, she's difficult to work with, and difficult to work with could be. 
could you pick me up from the station or even could you drop me back at the station because the show finishes at 11, the last train is at 11, 12 and I don't have anywhere to stay and the walk is mm -hmm. tw 15 minutes or it's down a dark alley or anything, difficult to work with. So we had to be as independent, well, if the guys can make it, you can make it here. We had to be as mm. independent as anything else so we wouldn't say no. And when we were forced to stop in the pandemic and I, you know, reacquainted myself with things like my children and... Um, <laughs> And just time to self and just being forced to stop and being forced, you know, to actually cook food that wasn't a Ginster's pasty uh, from, from a service station and, and really recognize how important it was. It made it a lot easier coming out the other end of it to go, actually, no, it's in my best. There's no re If I go and take that gig, I might make no money or even lose money to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's happening, I think, all over comedy. I think we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot less, tra you know, we're not seeing northern comics come south, southern, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot less travel. I think that also has to do with our increased conscientiousness to carbon footprints as mm -hmm. well, to be fair. But I think that, that that really brought it home that I need to, and also I'm, I'm just not the same. You, you're like elastic. I, I always felt like as a 20 year old, you're elastic and you ping, it pings back. You know what I mean? The next day yeah, you wake up, you go, woohoo, I'm awake, I'm alive. Um, and, I, and, and now I'm more like granny knickers that have been washed on too high a setting. <laughs> and then put in the dryer. You know, mm -hmm. that elastic it just it doesn't have the, quite the same ping to it. You I know, so, I, so I'm just, I'm going to just slow it down a little bit. So yeah. that, and, and so it's quality over quantity now. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here. You guys are fucking legendary, and I'm so glad to be sat here with you. Um, and not legendary and I've been doing comedy for a long time with legendary and a, wow, you just popped on the scene tonight. You're killing it. Um, <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. Guys, please, a round of applause for Ria Lina and Shazam. Uh, my name is Kim Bob. Thank you for coming. Good night. Oh, I told you it was an important conversation. I'm so grateful for Ria and Shazia for being so open about things that are often really difficult to talk about or can be scary to talk about, about the industry, about life, about love. Um, yeah, we owe a lot to them. Oh, anyway, if you like listening, tell a friend. If you didn't, tell your nemesis. Uh, the incredible comics you've heard all have projects you can enjoy and support. So please follow Rialina and Shazia Mirza online. Um, and the Fuck It Up podcast, as always, is brought to you by the Fems of Color Comedy Club, the House of the 